Well, our time together this morning will be brief, but I want us to take a look at a short passage in, in Luke 19 that is absolutely overflowing with meaning. If you remember where we left off last week, uh, it, it, Jesus is coming into Jerusalem for the final time during his earthly life. And it's the Passover festival that is taking place, and so there are massive crowds that are traveling alongside him, and, and these crowds begin cheering and praising him as he uh, approaches the city, and they are making quite a scene. It's so much so that the religious leaders, uh, they, they stop and they demand that Jesus stop the crowds from praising him. After all, they were calling him their king. And the religious leaders knew that the Romans certainly would not like that. You and I, viewing this as we do from history, we know that the words of that crowd really didn't mean very much. We know that those who were so passionately crying out, blessed be the king, a few days later they would be crying out, crucify him. Jesus, too, he also knew the reality that, that was hidden beneath the surface of their praises. He knew that they would reject him. He, he knew that they would earn God's very just condemnation. He knew that they would rightly face God's judgment, and that grieved him. It grieved him deeply. Well, let's take a look at our passage. Uh, grab your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 19. Will you do this? Will you stand with me? I'll read our passage. You can follow along. Uh, Luke chapter 19, uh, beginning in verse 41. Here's what Luke writes regarding Jesus. As he approached and saw the city, he wept for it, saying, if you knew this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. For the days will come on you when your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground. They will not leave one stone on another in your midst because you did not recognize the time when God visited you. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'd speak to our hearts in this time. That you'd open our eyes to, to see the scene before us in your word. Pray that we would see the heart of Jesus. That we would understand his dealings with men. God, that we would be changed by it all. Teach us this morning, Lord, and change us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Very quickly, I want us to consider three things that are found in this passage. First of all, I want us to see Jesus' heart for rebellious sinners. Jesus' heart for rebellious sinners. Secondly, I want us to contemplate the fact that Jesus' love for us does not preclude his judgment of sin. He loves us, yes, but he still judges sin. And thirdly, I want us to consider prophecy that is now approaching in light of prophecy which was so clearly fulfilled. Let's get started. Look there at verse 41. As Jesus approached and saw Jerusalem, he's coming over the, uh, the Mount of Olives, and so he's there on the hill overlooking the city. The city is laid out below him, and he sees Jerusalem, and it causes him to weep. 
He says, if you knew this day, what would bring you peace? But it's hidden from your eyes. Now, if I were Jesus, that's something right there that you can be thankful is not the case. But if I were Jesus, I, I'm pretty sure I would not be weeping for Jerusalem at that point. I mean, knowing what was going to take place that week, knowing the disrespect and the rejection and the torture and the injustice, knowing the brutality that Jerusalem would pour out upon Jesus find it amazing that he would weep for them. That's real love, isn't it? That, that's, that's biblical love. That's, that's 1 Corinthians 13 love. It's love that is patient, that is kind. It's not self-seeking. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It bears all things. It endures all things. That is a love that does not and will not end. It refuses to. Now clearly it's, it's the people. It's not the city. It's not the geographic location, but it's the people that Jesus cries for here. And he cries because he came to give them something very good. He came to offer them peace. He came to be Emmanuel, to be God with them, to give them peace with God. Paul will later on write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. That was why Christ came. That is what Christ came to do. He came to reconcile us back to God. That, that this reconciliation was achieved not by something that we would do, uh, but by what it is that Christ himself did. He came to offer the people of Jerusalem peace, precisely to offer them peace with God, but they refused him. They rejected him. And in so doing, they rejected their only chance, their only opportunity to be at peace with God, to be forgiven, to experience the, uh, the real purpose, not only for their lives, but for life itself, to experience what it was they were made for, to know real life. They gave all that up when they rejected Jesus, and that broke Jesus' heart. Despite their ignorant rebelliousness, despite their disrespectful words, despite their vicious brutality and the pain and the humiliation of all that they would inflict upon Jesus, his concern was for them. He wept for them. He'd come to offer them salvation, and they had rejected it. Friends, that was Jesus' heart for rebellious sinners then. And thankfully, that's his heart for us today. Aren't you glad for that? As undeserving and as insolent as we are, and yet he still does not want any of us to be lost. 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes this. He says, the Lord does not want any of us to perish, but all to come to repentance. Understand this. No matter where you're coming from, no matter what your history is, and no matter what you've done or, 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 or who you've become, he is for you. He is for you, and he offers this to you. He offers salvation. He offers to pay the debt for your sin in your place. He invites you to turn to him, to entrust your life in his hands. That's Jesus' heart for rebellious sinners. 
let me ask you this. Is that our heart for them? Is that how we think of those who might scream crucify him? Is that our heart towards those who are, are desperately lost and entangled in their sin? Probably isn't. That's why we need to ask the Lord to give us his heart for the lost. Not so much for the, you know, the super repentant, apologetic, and remorseful person. That's easy, right? No, 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 we need his heart for the one who is still lost, for the one who is still defiant, for the one who is still spitting in our face, for the rebel. We need the Lord to give us his heart, his love for them. Because that's what we're to offer them. We need the Lord to remind us of his undeserved love for us. That's how he loved us, isn't it? And we need him to give us the gracious humility of Jesus. Jesus wept for the people of Jerusalem. And he wept for them because he knew what was coming for them. Look at verse 43. Jesus says, for the days will come on you. Here's what's going to happen, he says. Your enemies will build a barricade around you, surround you, and hem you in on every side. They will crush you and your children among you to the ground, and they will not leave one stone on another in your midst. Why? Because you did not recognize the time when God visited. What Jesus says is that because God's people, because Israel had rejected him, they were going to experience his retribution. They, they had refused God's Savior. They had refused God's forgiveness, and so they would suffer God's judgment. And as Jesus says here, that judgment would include the total destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem would be surrounded, laid siege to, attacked, defeated, destroyed. It would be a complete and a total devastation. And that is exactly what took place. Forty years later, when the Jews rebelled against Rome, the city was surrounded. It was laid siege to. It was attacked. It was defeated. It was destroyed. It, it was burned to the ground. Uh, the temple itself was taken apart stone by stone by soldiers who were seeking after gold that had melted when it had all been set ablaze. Those stones were pushed over the edge of the Temple Mount, which, by the way, is where they lie today. Later, the city was, well, was further annihilated by the Emperor Hadrian. It, they claimed that you could run a plow, a farmer's plow, through where the city had been because the destruction was so complete. It all happened just as Jesus said it would. And we should keep that in mind. In light of the way the biblical prophecies of the past have been precisely fulfilled over the course of history, we should consider those things that Jesus says are about to come. I would encourage us to contemplate those prophecies that are, are still future in light of those that have been so clearly fulfilled and to know that these things, too, will surely come to pass. We can know with great certainty that he will do those things that he said that he would do after he catches us up to be with him. In fact, we can see many of those things being set up, being laid in place even today. Revelation, Ezekiel, so many other uh, prophecies in Scripture uh, talk about how God is going to bring judgment against this whole world that has rejected him. And we can know with certainty that he will do what he has promised to do at the end of all things that he will bring complete and final judgment 
against all of creation. He will set right every wrong, and he will punish every sin. Now, if, if you think that sounds devastatingly horrific, you're right. You're right. But know this, you don't have to face that judgment. That's why Jesus came. He offers forgiveness. Turn to him. Trust him with your life. He bore God's judgment of sin in your place. That's why we call him Savior. As we live out our lives, we need to keep in mind as well that God's love and mercy toward us does not preclude his judgment of sin. We who have put our trust in Jesus, because he died in our place, God is not going to judge us. But because God loves us, he will not leave us to rot in our sin. He will confront us, and he will trouble us, and he will judge our sin because that is what is best for us. And because it is the only response that a God who is good and who is holy, who is right and fair, can have. We tend to understand this most readily regarding God's dealing with others. And yet we have a really difficult time uh, really coming to terms with it when it regards us. You know, if someone hurts us or rips us off, uh, we fully understand that the only, the only right thing for God to do is to bring them to absolute justice. But when we do something wrong, we always seem to think that mercy is a better idea. And so when someone cuts us off in traffic or speeds recklessly past us, we immediately imagine driving past them as they get a ticket. Sweet justice, right? But if we ever happen to exceed the speed limit or cut someone off like I did really badly on Friday, if you're here, I'm sorry, we immediately want and hope for and even expect mercy. There are two things we've got to understand about God's mercy. First of all, we've got to understand that it does not come cheap. Jesus bought it for us with his death. And second of all, we need to understand that it is intended to change us not to indulge us. We read clearly in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we were redeemed from our empty way of life. And just as a reminder, that way of life that we used to live, it's empty. It's empty. It's hollow. It ends in disappointment. Or we may be tempted to turn back to it. We may be pulled back to those old ways. And yet we are reminded here of two things. First of all, that it is empty. And second of all, that we have been purchased out of that at a great, great price. What does Peter say? We have been purchased. We have been redeemed from that, not with perishable things but with the precious blood of Christ. Uh, friends, understand this. Remember this. God's grace comes to us freely, but it was not cheaply bought. You have been purchased out of sin at a great, great price. Do not lightly go back in. Romans chapter 2 warns us, not to despise the riches of his kindness, not to disregard it, and not to, to value it too lowly. Don't despise the riches of his kindness, his restraint and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. That mercy we desire, that mercy we receive, his mercy is given to change us, to set us free from sin, not to set us free to sin. 
turn. Turn away from your sin. If Jesus called us to repent, it just means to turn around, to turn our back on sin and to turn to him. Know one last thing about God's mercy. Sometimes God's mercy tastes and looks and feels like discipline. Sometimes God's greatest mercy is his toughest love. When he doesn't let us get away with something so that we will learn to stay away from it. So that we'll mature. That's what Proverbs chapter 3 is telling us about. Yeah, there the, uh, the writer of Proverbs says, Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son. Do not loathe his discipline. For the Lord disciplines the one that he loves. Understand this, Christian. God will discipline you because he loves. I hope you'll ponder these things in this passage. I hope you'll let them soak in and impact your living and your thinking. I hope that you will see, that you will, you, you will understand Jesus' heart for rebellious sinners. And that you'll ask him to give you that heart yourself. I pray that you will understand that the love of Jesus does not preclude his judgment of sin. Yes, God is love, but God is also holy and righteous, and he will deal with sin, including ours. And I hope you will consider this in light of the way that God has kept his prophetic promises in the past you can know with certainty that he will keep them in the future. We see it coming, don't we? Because our king is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this tiny little passage so overflowing with powerful truths. Lord, we ask that you would shape us by them. I pray that we, would, we wouldn't we would fall into the trap of acknowledging truth, agreeing with truth, without being changed by it. And I pray for anyone who has not turned to you who has never come to that place of surrender, of trusting their lives in your hands. Lord, this morning, having heard of your love and your mercy and your offer of forgiveness and cleansing, that they would turn from their sin and turn to you and trust themselves to you, submit themselves to you. Lord, for each of us, that we would be shaped by you. We would have your heart for others. That, Lord, your mercy would transform us, would change us. That the fact that you have paid for our freedom from sin would move us to turn and to walk away from it. And Lord, we would live our lives with the confidence that you are coming again because you promised us that you would. Work in us, Lord. Bring fruit from your word. We pray it in Jesus' name.